Here they come. It's going to be a very full screen of cubes soon. <laughs> I'm going to try next week to put this on my TV and then I can see everybody. Yeah, that's a good idea. We had, uh, Shelly, we had somebody set up you no know, trivia last night. So our, our, we did a, our whole team did a trivia game on our computer. It was really fun. What, what um, platform did you use? Was it Jackbox TV? She, no. Um, she, cre she created the game in PowerPoint. Um, and it was, it was just, we, we had a ball doing it. Oh, if fun. I, if anybody on the call wants the PowerPoint to do it with their friends, just and I'll send it around. I love that. So it looks like we have about 20 people and we had approximately 50 people register. So we'll just give it a minute. Or two. Put some fresh ice and a lime in that drink of yours, whatever you're drinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Top it off. All right, we still have some people joining, so we'll wait another minute. All right, shall we get started? Keith, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. Shall All right, great. <laughs> and I'm just curious, are you able to see, I know you can see the PowerPoint, are you able to see the videos on my screen as well or just the PowerPoint? Um, videos of the people? Yeah. Yeah, I can control what I see on that. Okay, all right, good. I want to make sure. Okay, good. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Happy, happy hour. Happy HR at home. Happy hour. Thank you so much for joining us for our second week. We're certainly very glad to have you. Um, have received some uh, helpful feedback from last week. So please feel free to share with Keith or Vicki or Michael or myself any other thoughts that you have. We also can want to continue to put out a solicitation that if you have any companies 
if you work for any companies or know of any companies who might have a really interesting or good story to share on this group, please feel free to email any, of, any one of us so we can tee you up in the subsequent weeks. Again, um, just similar to last week, these are our objectives for today. Um, you know, first and foremost, we want to stay connected now that we've been home, I don't know, seven weeks? Is this week seven, I think? Um, I miss people more and more every day, and it's just a nice way to see friendly faces and, and this our HR community and Philadelphia community to stay connected, so I certainly appreciate the time. Just like last week, we're going to have Keith give us um, what the important legal updates are from last week or since last week and have a chance to ask him any questions. We have a guest speaker today to share some best practices from American Reading Company, and that's Gina Klein. She's their chief program officer, so we'll get to Gina in a few minutes. Um, and then she's gracious enough to be able to stay on for a little while as well after her presentation to, ask, or to answer Q&A. Um, if you have a question, since we're doing the Zoom call differently than last week, if you have a question, um, if you uh, pull up your uh, menu bar, which is probably at the bottom of your screen perhaps, um, there's a couple tabs like mute, stop video, et cetera. There's one that says participants. If you click on participants and then click raise hand, our moderator, who is uh, Dylan Foley from Juno, will see that you've raised your hand. We can unmute your line and you can ask a question. So again, it's participants, raise hand, and then we will um, unmute your line so you can ask the question. So Dylan, maybe just because I can't see that feature, I'm not sure the other presenters will either. Just make sure you interrupt us if there are any questions so that we, we can stop and take those. All right, well, thanks again, everyone for coming and uh, I'll get started by handing it over to Keith to talk about our legal update for the week. Great, thank you, Shelley. Um, you know, as we've talked about, for those of you who were with us last week uh, or have read some of the email invitations, we wanted to make this a little bit different from a lot of the webinars that are out there. and. There are so many really good, strong legal update webinars that we really didn't want that to be the focus of this. We wanted it to be more, as Shelley said, to, um, to just have an opportunity to interact with our, our fellow HR colleagues and see each other a little bit and um, share some best practices. But we do want to make sure that we at least highlight each week um, any changes that come along that might be things for us to look into a little bit more. And um, we've picked three for this week. Uh, just to make sure that we're aware of. And the first is the, the hidden threat of WARN violations that we're calling it. Uh, the WARN Act, as most of you are aware, the Worker Adjustment Retraining Notification Act talks about a 60-day notice that's required for um, mass layoffs or plant closings. Um, that has a, a kind of business interruption um, defense built into it. So for the most part, um, when COVID first hit, it wasn't a real concern for employers um, if they didn't give the appropriate notice, but the hidden threat that comes in now is with the PPP program and bringing people back to work for a particular period of time. Once that ends, arguably, um, if there are layoffs as a result of that, uh, the WARN Act notifications might be triggered because it can no longer be considered an unexpected or unanticipated event because we're now aware of it and we're aware that that might end. Um, so in addition to the federal law, there are state WARN acts that we call mini WARN acts, New Jersey being one of the more uh, restrictive ones. So it's just a highlight here um, to make sure it's on your radar uh, to talk to employment counsel. If you get in a situation when, if you were fortunate enough to get one of the loans or one of the loans that will be hopefully coming again soon when that program's replenished, once that ends, if you get in a position where you then need to lay off additional people uh, because you don't have the funds to keep them employed, just keep in mind at that point that you may have 60 day notice obligations, which means you have to pay them for 60 days if you don't give it. So consult with your employment counsel is really the message on that. It's really just to raise, um, to raise the flag on this and to make sure it's on your radar. The other big thing that came out since we spoke last week, uh, the Department of Labor issued yet more guidance uh, on uh, frequently asked questions with respect to the FFCRA. And this time they addressed um, the circumstances under which an employer can require an employee to use existing leave or an employee may request to use existing leave, whether that's PTO or an employer's paid sick leave in conjunction with um, either the, um, the extended, I'm sorry, the emergency paid sick leave law or the, um, the Family Medical Leave Act plus 
or emergency FMLA law. So there are some, some Q and A's and some really helpful guidance in there about an employee being able to choose to use uh, PTO um, and PSL um, at the same time and, and opportunities for an employer to say, um, you have the right to use um, PTO uh, and, and emergency time. So just make sure you look into those um, because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different, um, different approaches that can be taken. And in some of those cases, the employer can require it, um, but in most of them, it's the employee's choice or it has to be by agreement of the employee and the employer uh, to allow the employee to use uh, time that they may have with the employer under PTO uh, to run concurrently with the emergency FMLA or emergency paid sick leave. So just wanted to keep that on your radar as well. And then also that they, they also uh, have clarified the recordable event for OSHA if uh, an individual contracts COVID-19 as a result of work. Uh, that is a recordable event. The issue is going to become the proof or the, um, the ability to show that it, it was in fact contracted in the workplace or as part of their work. But if it is, it has been clarified that that's a recordable event that we now need to uh, follow OSHA guidelines for reporting purposes on that. So we just wanted to highlight those three things. Again, uh, not getting into a a heavy level of detail. There's a lot of webinars out there that will do that, but wanted them to be on your radar uh, in case you have questions about them. Thanks, Keith. Dylan, do we have any questions? No questions as of yet. All right, great. Uh, as always, Keith, thank you. I think, uh, you know, just when you think we've sort of bottomed out on how to interpret rules or what's different, always, there's always some updates. So I think at least in my opinion, starting the call with just some quick hits and things for us to be aware of is super helpful. So thank you for that. Oh, the other and thing, then, Shelley, too, I'm sorry. The, uh, the other thing I forgot to mention is a lot of you probably have seen uh, the Senate has approved now um, the, the next level of, um, of funding, another 310 billion or so um, for the PPP. So that needs to get through the House but for all of the small businesses out there and small employers who did not get any funding the first time around, hopefully there's some relief coming very shortly um, from uh, what we can tell. Yeah, yeah. great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and then I guess I'll turn it back over to you again to introduce our, introduce our guest speaker for today. Yeah, great. Um, I'm very pleased and excited to introduce Gina Klein, who's Chief Program Officer at American Reading Company out in King of Prussia, and I'll let Gina talk a little bit more about what ARC does, but um, this is one of, this is our first attempt um, to really share with all of you um, some organizations that have really, in our opinion at least, um, done everything the right way in terms of getting out in front of this quickly, uh, early, uh, treating their employees the right way, handling things the right way. And Gina's been kind enough today to, to spend some time with us just kind of walking us through what American Reading Company has done in this regard and how they've gotten out in front of this. And, and in my opinion, at least, have really provided a textbook response, both in terms of leadership and leadership communication during a crisis. So Gina, if you want to uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, you and American Reading Company, and then we can, we can talk a little bit about what you guys have done. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, American Reading Company is a, I guess we count as a mid-sized business. Technically, we have almost 300 employees. Our headquarters are in King of Prussia, um, but we have about a third of our workforce is spread out across the country. And we offer reading, writing, science, social studies curriculum, and libraries of books to school districts, kindergarten to 12th grade, English and Spanish and then teacher training, data analysis, basically a system for helping school districts turn things around or improve. And we've been in business for 21 years. I've been there for 19 of them. And I think that we have always been focused on taking care of all aspects of employees so this wasn't so sort of something that wasn't that much of a surprise to us that we did a decent job on it because we're sort of neurotic and um, productively paranoid. 
Uh, but um, do you want me to go right into that or anything else about the company first? Yeah, no, that's good. That's great. Um, you know, you can jump right into it. I mean, you guys were, were ahead of the curve and, and maybe that productive paranoia had something to do with it, but I'll let you talk about that and how you got there. Yeah, I would say two things about that. Our CEO, um, I'm the CEO in apprenticeship, so, but she's, our CEO is a, a germaphobe, always has been, and she started paying attention to this in January and sending us articles about it. And I think one of my primary jobs, HR is one of my teams, and one of my primary jobs is to work with her on what to say to the whole company versus what to say just to some of us. And, but pretty quickly it became clear that there was no harm in practicing. And I don't know if any of you have read the book Unthinkable, but it's one of my favorite books. It's a nonfiction book on who survives in an emergency and who doesn't. And basically the answer is the people who practice survive. People who react first and practice. People who get up when they see smoke, when they smell smoke in a restaurant. And don't wait for everybody else. So we're sort of those kinds of people. And what we started saying to people in February was this may never come here. This may never be a problem, but let's practice working from home. Let's practice social distancing. That will be good for the flu anyway. Uh, let's just practice just in case. And it also, we have always had a do not come to work if you're sick policy. And we, and all managers are expected to send people home if they, if they come to work sick. In February, the end of February, we announced to employees that for the month of March, we were suspending the tracking of time off because we did not want anyone to even think about whether or not they should come to work. If you were thinking about it, you shouldn't come. If anyone in your home was sick, if anyone in your home thought they might be sick, just stay home. You've unlimited time off for the month of March. I think we announced that on the last day of February, maybe. Um, no, that was a Saturday. So March, March 2nd. And right away we said, okay, we're, we're, we're going to figure this out in phases. And Jane and I outlined our CEO, a set of phases for phase one. There are outbreaks, other places that will affect some of our employees and some of our customers, but not many all the way to phase four, everything shut down. And then our executive team began work on planning out the four phases on a daily ba basis with a COVID response team that I led that had members from every division. We were a week in when we went from phase one to phase three, <laughs> not realizing that was going to happen so quickly. Uh, but I vividly remember we, we had everybody go, everybody was working from home some days. Everyone was already doing social distancing. And I was on Zoom with what, our curriculum team and we had three people huddled around a computer on March 9th, 7th or something. And I said, I was like, that's it. No, this is no longer voluntary because people aren't listening. And so that Monday we moved, we rearranged all the offices so that nobody was within six feet of each other so that and by March 11th, we sent everybody home except our warehouse staff and our warehouse staff went to split shifts. And March 13th, an employee started showing COVID symptoms. She and her husband are both fine. They did test positive, but they're fine. They've recovered. But I think we were maybe one or two days, if we'd closed one or two days sooner, she was one of the three employees huddled around the computer a week earlier. And if we had a, uh, if we had closed even two days later, I think we might've had 20 people with COVID. Um, so that's, we were, we, were, we were to virtual by March 11th. Um, and then we became um, the question, so then the question became, are we gonna still have any money, of course? We sell to school districts and all the school districts closed. 
And I think that that's where having an integrated team, our COVID response team followed the recommendations of, I think it was the, I think it was McKinsey put out a, how to handle, how should businesses respond? And it had a set of things you should worry about, including employee safety and finances, but also a sales strategy and contingency plans. And so sales strategy became one of the things that this cross division team, including HR and finance and worked on every day was where will we bring, where will we find money? And if we don't, what will we do about it? And we have made three new products in six weeks. Um, and then when we've, Jane and I and other people follow the news every day. And the last, the last of those five sections of this McKinsey plan were communication. And we have been, while things were changing rapidly, we, Jane or I sent an email to the company every day, to our entire company, with what we knew and what we were thinking. And we have an all hands company meeting every Monday. Our, we went to virtual company meetings. We asked that every employee be on Zoom, on camera, on March 15th or whatever that Monday was. And we've had it every Monday, it's an hour long, and we tell the employees the whole truth. We have enough money for payroll for two more weeks. If we don't get more money, revenue doesn't come in, we are going to furlough people. This is what a furlough means. We've calculated we can pay everybody's health insurance, but not your salaries. We believe unemployment will be, will be available by then and you'll be able to get it. We hope that's not true. But the, we've told people that kind of information every Monday, every employee. This is how much money we have. This is how much has brought, been brought in. This is our break even which we've always been an open books company, so that's not 100% new, but we had people emailing me afterwards saying, after they'd been told that they might not have a paycheck in two weeks, saying that they'd never felt more loved by the company. And I think that's because people just want to be in, they want to be on the in crowd. They want to be part of what's, of knowing everything anybody else knows. Now, we did get the Paycheck Protection Loan. Um, we're very up on the news. And we had our, all of our numbers ready for our bankers the day it was approved. The loan was, uh, program was, was passed by Congress and signed. And we were teaching the bankers about it. This is, this is the section. Here's what you know. And... Um, it opened on Sunday and then we had our finance team, two people from my finance team took turns calling the bank morning and night until our money came in every day for a week and a, a week and a half um, to the point where they got really mad at us. But again, productive paranoia, our CEO was like, they're going to run out of money. And she was right. So, now we are in the lucky position of having the paycheck protection loan money and we were we haven't had to furlough anyone um, but everyone knows that in six weeks depending on revenue and depending on whether their job is required for the new work we're doing they they could be gone i'll stop there Gina, what are some of the things you've done um, during this time when employees are remote? How have you kept them engaged? How have you kept in contact or made them feel connected? Um, our HR team has started several initiatives. One of them is a parenting, parenting at home. Sorry, I have a dog digging in the background here. Um, uh, a parenting at home channel in Teams where we have maybe a hundred parents giving each other tips and advice and 
it was a really, really intense conversation on potty training the other day, um, just, just blowing off steam. We started ARC Family School because we have teachers and teacher trainers who work for us. We offer 30 minutes a day of, of synchronous on Zoom learning for every grade band K to 12 for our, for the children of ARC employees. And that creation of community for, for the kids, I think has made a big difference for parents. Um, we also have at least two non-work things happening a day. We have some sort of health thing happening, a virtual walk, yoga, meditation, something, usually around noon. And then sometime between four and five or six, we have a happy hour or a book club, or there are now a couple different bridge games going. I, I can't explain it, but bridge is coming. We're, bridge is going to make a comeback. Um, and letting, also just letting everybody make, have ideas for what they would want to do and then start it. Virtual coffee shop, um, anything people want. Our goal is that people are connected to, we have opportunities to connect to each other at least twice a day that aren't work. We have a lot of employees working at home by themselves and the social emotional well-being of our teams is part of my weekly conversations with my management team and part of their weekly conversations with all of their managers. How are your people doing? Who's actually depressed? Who's alone? Does anybody need money? Is anybody sick? Is anybody not able to work because their kids are a mess? Um, we are, it's probably in some ways things that you wouldn't ask each other. <laughs> Maybe we're not supposed to ask each other, but it's like all the rules are sort of out, <laughs> sort of different in this situation. Um, I said to, I run a leadership group. Anyone who supervises other employees who reports up to me, and we get together once a month. And I said to that group of 45 people, um, I spent Saturday laying on the floor crying. Now, you don't have to worry about me. I have the right support system. I had the right people to reach out to. I was fine, but I hit my wall. And if you haven't hit your wall yet, here's my cell phone number. When you hit your wall, I'm available. And I've had a couple people text me and be like, I hit my wall. Can I just tell you about it? And I think that combination of like, we're all a mess, but you don't have to take care of me, but I'll take care of you has been that balance that um, we've been trying to strike as an executive team. And then the executive team tries to take care of each other. Great. And you were, um, you used a really interesting phrase, if you could talk about it. You talked about intentionally making safe space for vulnerability. Expand on that a little bit. I love that. Well, we are we are a Brene Brown. We could you know we could out Brene Brown anyone but Brene Brown probably as a as a team in general. Um, but I think that we have made it a couple intentional practices to make vulnerability part of part of Zoom because it's certainly easy to just get to work, and we have. We start pretty much all Zooms with, how's everybody doing? And many of our management team take the initiative to say something not related to work. And we try to end every Zoom with something fun, funny, silly. Um, also, we have a practice with teams that are doing a lot of creative work that the manager of that team will text whoever is supervising or they're, wherever they're reporting to, they're showing me stuff. Um, I'll get a text with who's particularly vulnerable today. So and so is feeling fragile. So and so's spouse was just laid off. Maybe today's not the day to give them any inten intense feedback on their writing. Um, that that has become a, just a standard practice. Not that we're not going to tell people the truth, but today might not be the day they need to hear the whole truth. Maybe tomorrow. I would say those are two of the main ways. Um, 
also just talking about failure and fear, that we don't know what's going to happen and that we don't know how to work in this environment and to admit that and to let everybody help figure it out. And, um, you know, as you just said, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what the future is going to bring. But as you look into that, that crystal ball of, of reentry and getting back to business, you see anything that maybe will be different on the other side that started because of this and, and might change as a result? Think of two main things. Um, one, in terms of schools, our customers, I think that our customers are rethinking the extent to which they will be in, in physical buildings the same way. Certainly, I, I think it'll be surprising if we see classes of 35 kids in a room again in the, any time in the near future. So there's certainly a rethinking of how school will work. Um, which schools are very clear, they're open for business, stuff is happening, they're buying, they're planning to educate kids, they're just thinking about it differently. And I would say, similarly for us, before COVID, the third of our company who worked remotely felt like they were, they were not part of the culture in the same way. And the H the HR team number one initiative before COVID was, you know, hashtag one team that they were going to figure out how to integrate the, uh, the external teams so that what we did worked for everybody. And I think that COVID proved to us how we do that. We will always have a company meeting on Mondays. We will probably never have a company meeting again where everyone's not sitting at their own screen because it makes all the difference in the world. And um, especially with breakout rooms, people are people make, people are getting to know people they didn't even know they worked for the same company. Um, so I would say that we will probably, we're excited to have a physical space and to work together, but not in the same way. And certainly my guess is everyone will work from home part of the time. and that we'll hire differently. We're ready to hire people around the country for jobs we used to say had to be in our, in our office because we didn't know how to onboard people without them being in our office. Suddenly everybody's available on Zoom. Well, it's not that we didn't, couldn't, it's that we just hadn't made a work rhythm that worked for people who weren't in the office. And now we know how. Yeah. Great. Um... Shelly, at this point, did you want to see if there were questions for Gina or? Uh... Yeah, Dylan, do you want to let us know if anyone put their hand up and let them ask? I don't see any hands up here. All right, well, I have a question for you, Gina. I, I know we're still in it and it might be hard to have hindsight yet because we're still in it. But if you look back now from to March 11th, would you have done anything differently? Anything else you would have done or you should have done that you didn't do that? Well, certainly I would, we would be, we would have canceled a lot of meetings faster mm. so that people could just be more productive. It's amazing, a lot of our product development, it's amazing how fast it goes when people can't wander in and create unnecessary meetings. Which is not that people aren't spending time with each other. You see, we're, we're doing yoga and having happy hour at four o'clock. We're certainly not working nine, 900 hours a week, but um, we could have been doing product development faster and more efficiently mm -hmm. if we had been pushier about what meetings had to happen and how long they needed to be. Yeah. I've heard people say two things. One, not being in the same space is sometimes prohibitive to have just having those accidental discussions at the coffee station that could be productive, not just engaging, but also productive. Um, and then on the other side, you hear it was a lot of waste. It could have been a lot of wasted time. So to your point, it is, um, I find myself really maximizing the time that I spend with people, even if it's just 
um, having a check-in call. Some, some groups I work with, we do a 30 minute check-in and if some work gets done, great. If not, it is sort of that social check-in that you mentioned, but it's, I think it's way more thoughtful now and deliberate than I'm going to sit in your office with my coffee, maybe for 12 minutes when we could do it for probably two, right? Mm -hmm. And you have multiple of those of course, on the course of a day or a week, you think about potential lost productivity, yet still being able to have that, I think, human interaction in a, in a, in a more thoughtful way, perhaps, is, is, has changed. Okay, we have a question here from Deirdre. Um, have you done anything, Gina, proactively to change your recruiting process yet? Well... We were working on that before this started because we have, we've been, we're, we're in the second year of a sort of official internal equity audit where we have been tracking the rate of higher promotion and raises by race to see whether we are equitable across racial groups and across representations and we are not horrible, but certainly not where we would want to be by any stretch of the imagination. And we have we had been analyzing what is keeping us from recruiting the people we want. Um, so we had just made some radical changes in how we recruited, mostly using being willing to pay recruiters was the thing we just gave up and said, you know what, fine, we'll pay recruiters. And we, we've had a lot of success with that. We did freeze all hiring. Um, right now we're not hiring anyone because we are trying to maintain the employees we have and waiting to see what happens. I don't know, except for that I think we will continue to pay recruiters because that is getting us a more diverse pool of qualified applicants. Um, changing the limits so that we'll take people from anywhere in the country is the other thing that's going to change. Yeah, I was thinking you're using more e-enabled tools. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Deirdre. Dylan, anyone else? I know people have to have questions for you, Gina. I mean, I have like a whole Wait, page of notes. Alan, this one? Looks like I have a Alan. question, but I just unmuted myself. Am I supposed to? Hi, Alan. <laughs> go, for yeah, go ahead. I don't know if I'm supposed to raise my hand or create a reaction or something like that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Gina, okay. um, very interesting. Thank you for sharing. In regards to uh, essentially empathy, I see a lot of the leadership placing, uh, I mean, wonderful leadership amongst all their entire workforce, most importantly, being very empathetic to everybody's situation. How is it with coworker to coworker in regards to like, you can't necessarily teach them to be empathetic, but like, how are they essentially working together? Are they still collaborating and people more or less just kind of focus on getting their projects done and getting out? Or how do you still keep the camaraderie within the organization now, especially since everybody's remote? You know, so I was at Wharton this, uh, this past spring and we did this survey of employees and our, our company outscored the, the, was above the highest part of the standard, some sort of high off the chart score and companion at love. I think that we, I don't, I don't have to help employees care about each other. They're teaching me how to be nicer and how to care more deeply. They're, they're the ones saying, you know, um, so-and-so just got engaged, so-and-so was having a hard day, so-and-so just got, got diagnosed with cancer, whatever it is. Um, we have a, a culture where people, when someone was hospitalized, people moved into her house and took turns staying overnight to take care of her baby for six months. And coworkers. So <laughs> like, we're sort of a special place like that. I think that incurred what people needed was permission to spend some of their work time doing that while on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And permission to not work all the hours. 
And we have been intentionally saying to people, hey, I'm going on a walk. I won't, I won't be available to one from one to two. I'm going on a walk or I'm going running or I'm taking a nap. And you should too, whenever you want. Like work the schedule that works for you. Hang out with people when you want to hang out with them. Everyone's getting plenty of work done. That's not our problem. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's not is not empathetic. We, we do a really good job teaching them how to be empathetic. We fire them. <laughs> <laughs> Got you. So it's like embedding in the culture primarily is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That's a joke. We help. <laughs> Everybody's muted so you couldn't hear them laughing. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, yeah. Alan. It uh, looks like someone sent me a message. So Kat Bird has a question. I think Kat, you can unmute yourself or Dylan, maybe you can. Yeah, can everyone hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, hopefully you can see me as well. Um, so Gina, this was really powerful. I too have like three pages worth of notes. I think what you touched on is just the intentionality and I love the idea of you giving your employees space to one, be vulnerable and share that vulnerability. And then two, say, hey, I'm taking a walk, I'm taking a nap. How do you see that continuing kind of post COVID? So as we kind of get back to, you know, this new state of, of working, when all of this is kind of, you know, come to a, a halt, um, how are you going to continue to be intentional about that so that people don't just get jolted back into kind of the chaos that, that we're, we're used to? I have been thinking so hard about how to maintain naps. Mm -hmm. I'm, I am not joking about that. It, without providing spaces in a work environment where people can lay down in private, because I'm mm, you have 300 employees and teenagers in the summer, and there's all sorts of other problems we could have. But the idea of a nap space seems like a great idea to me. Um, I think the first thing is that we probably won't bring anyone back five days a week. That we will ask people to think about how they want their schedule to be and to have people come back to work some portion, but to keep some days that they don't come in or to come in for the same couple hours a day if they live close by and that works better for them. I think the other thing that's just so clear is that us dictating what that schedule should be, even if it, we think it's the best schedule in the world, is wrong. That some people want to come to work every day because it's, it's required for them psychologically to get out of their house. And other people want to work at home all the time. And other people want to work at home every afternoon I, that, or come in at 10. And I think that people have proven in a different way that they are able to get the work done with minimal, lots of support and collaboration, but no oversight. No worry about whether you're working. Nobody can tell whether you're working or not, mm -hmm. what hours you're where. And so I think that we will have a, we were already pretty lax, but I think we'll have a significant relaxing of what it means to be at work. And if you want your work time to be 9 to 10 a.m. and then the middle of the night, why does that matter? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Gina, I know you originally said that you may have to jump off a little early and it's, it's coming up on that time. Do you have time to maybe have one more question if we have another one in the queue? Sure, one more. Great, anything out there, Dylan? Nothing on my end here. All right, well, I, the rest of us can stay on if we have a, other dialogue we want to have, we're happy to stay on. But Gina, thank you so much. I, 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 uh, you really have given uh, me a ton of things to think about, and I'm sure others. I've been getting some text messages, by the way, saying, wow, she's great. So I'll just share that with you. Oh. Um, so thank you so much. I don't know, Keith, I, I'll, I'll let you sort of end it with Gina since she was your guest. Sure. Um, I just want to thank you so much for for coming on and sharing all of these things. When you and I first spoke, I was just blown away with, you know, the, the planning and the foresight and, and the empathy and the kindness and the engagement that you guys demonstrate. Uh, and, and like I said, it's just a textbook response to a situation like this. And I think um, 
I, I really wanted it to be recognized, the leadership role that, that you and Jane and everyone in the organization took. And, and I know it's appreciated by your employees. And, um, you know, the thing that got me the most was, you know, how they felt so appreciated when you told them they might be furloughed. And that just goes to show how critical honest communication is. Um, because if you're, if you're not being honest and open and genuine, then don't even bother. So uh, I just want to thank you so much for your time today. Uh, you gave us all a lot of great things to think about and um, wishing you and all of ARC the best moving forward as we get through this. Well, thank, thank you so much for having me. It was so good to meet you all. And thank you, Keith, for the invitation. Sure. Thank Thanks, you, Gina. Thanks, Gina. Bye, everyone. Bye. So now we're gonna we're gonna try something fun, maybe. I don't know, we'll see. It may not be fun, but we thought, why don't we just open it up and chat if we can chat? I'm gonna stop sharing here and see how this goes. There we go. So if we just wanna open up and, and share other ideas or ask questions of the group, we're gonna do our best to not make this crazy. Um, but I think there's like 40 of us on or something like that, 30 maybe. Um, anyone else have any other question or, or they want to put out to the group of really smart, good looking, semi sober HR professionals on the group today? <laughs> I'll, I'll kick off a, a question that maybe somebody has an answer to. I was going to ask Gina, but I know she was running out of time. I'm curious if anybody has started thinking about and putting a plan together to bring people back to the office and kind of what that looks like. I mean, I know she touched on schedules are going to look different, so on and so forth, but what about the physical bringing back your people? Um, what are you communicating to them as to like, what's going to flag to you? Yep, we're ready to go back. And then what measures are you putting in place to, to do that? So that was actually going to be my question um, because I've been tasked to do that. Um, so kind of where we are right now is we're going to send out a survey to our employees and we've kind of been myself and my counterpart who's down in Orlando. So their legislation looks very different than our, at ours in Philadelphia right now. Um, but we kind of want to be across the board as safe as possible. So um, and make sure employees feel safe as well. So we wanted to send out a survey um, and touch on each and everything, childcare, transit, um, you know, anything that we can possibly think of if and just in general doesn't feel safe being around a certain amount of people. What would make you feel safe? Things like that. And then we want to touch base individually after we get all the survey results back with each employee. Um, from there and kind of drill down from there and see what they, um, you know, what exactly, you know, they were talking about. Um, for Philadelphia, our office in Philadelphia specifically, uh, what we really plan on doing as far as transit goes, because a lot of our employees don't even live in the city, they're taking transit from the suburb. We, suburbs, we want to look at um, at least giving them whatever the highest, uh, Trade passes, I think it's $204 a month, um, you know, supplementing people with that to pay for parking um, because they're not going to be in the office every single day. We'll still have people kind of staggering coming back in. Um, uh, we have some employees in offices, but we have a lot of employees in cubicles too. So we'll look at the floor plan and see, you know, who uh, would be close, too close and kind of stagger it that way. We would also have everyone that is always, um, that's coming into the office, always coming in together. We wouldn't have people switching in and out um, so that, you know, it's consistent as to who you're there with. Um, depending how soon we would go back, you know, right now they're mandating you wear masks at work. So we would mandate that as well. Um, taking temperatures, you know, every day coming in and things like that too. So we're kind of, it's just, you know, trying to think of everything, but still, you know, we want to reach out to our employees too, so they can give us feedback as well. I know a lot of employees are really also concerned about FSA accounts. Um, transit, you can stop. However, dependent care, they still haven't done anything about that. I think a lot of summer camps are going to be canceled. Um, you know, as of right now, they're not able to pay for daycare too. So, kind of keeping our eye out on that as well. I don't know if anyone heard anything about that too. That was kind of another question I had as well. 
And I would assume you'd take a cut of that as far as what jobs can be remote almost 100% of the time. Yeah, I mean, we all have been doing perfectly fine. So we're not gonna rush back into the office by any means. Um, even our, our admins, we've um, gotten mail forwarded to one of their homes. They're scanning everything in. Um, we've, we've, we've figured everything out. We're running completely fine. Um, so, you know, it's just, event. We, we weren't as prepared getting out of the office because it kind of, it took us by storm. Um, so we really want to look to be prepared going back into the office and making employees feel as if, you know, they are being thought of and, and their safety is going to come first. I mean, there's going to be so many anxieties. I know me for one, I'm anxious about it as well. So, uh, you know, we're just trying to cover all the bases there. I mean, kids, kids might be home all summer too. So you know, we just have to think of everything. How many employees do you have? Um, in our Philadelphia office, we have, I would say about 50. But we have um, four in New York. Um, in Orlando, we have about 20. In Atlanta, we have about 20. Um, but we're a UK based operation. So there's mm -hmm. over 100 there. Um, I just started with the company in, at the end of January too. So I've been, oh, wow. yeah, I've been remote longer than I've been in the office too. So, I mean, this has kind of been my job at this point. Um, and then we have a small office in Malta and Bermuda. There are no accidents, Michelle. I think you're there for a reason. <laughs> yeah. 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 Good stuff. Anyone else have any other comments to Michael's question about thinking about getting back to work? I've been talking with some folks about, um, I haven't put the full program together yet, but I started to call it reboarding. Just to think about um, anything that you might have missed. So obviously doing an internal postmortem on how you handled the situation. And in addition to being extremely honest with yourself mm -hmm. on where maybe you didn't do a good job, um, a few things to consider because I think, you know, if you had a, if you had any sort of emergency response plan for an emergency that was different than a global pandemic, then obviously some of that didn't hold up. But um, looking at things like what your compensation plan was going to be like for the next budget year, especially if you were in, a, in an organization that had to reduce pay for folks, at what point are you going to be able to bring them back and make them whole? And then has that time frame actually gone past when they would have had an annual review? So looking at when they would have had an expected increase because restoring someone's pay to 100% is certainly not the same mm -hmm. thing as uh, a review. And then maybe where your tech broke down, um, some folks that I've been talking to were not remotely prepared for working out of the office just because the business itself didn't allow it and then suddenly trying to figure out ways to if you were an essential business keep as many people employed as possible so taking a look at tech like what didn't work what did work what did you need more of because if you start staggering people at work especially if you're in an open office environment which god forbid you're the first person that coughs when everybody goes back to work like you're the you know you're going to be even if you have a cold or if it's allergies, like you're the one that coughed. Um, so staggering the folks to return in a way that makes people feel safe. Um, and also, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what, what needs to be done to make sure that people can continue to work from home for extended periods of time. Like Michelle said, there's going to be a lot of anxiety around this and folks that did not struggle with anxiety or any sort of mental health issue certainly might come out of this with something different, um, especially if you're a company that has a very rigid bereavement policy. So anyone that experienced any sort of loss in this situation has not been able to appropriately grieve. Anyone that may have gotten sick from COVID and didn't make it. So extending ways of grieving, making sure EAP policies cover things that really extend into the future because even if we do go back to work, people aren't going to be whole in many ways for a long time. So trying to think ahead and looking at policies and programs that don't support a way that we'll probably be continuing to work for maybe the better part of a year. Um, I think there's 
there are some things that HR people who love rules are like really rigid in um, and, and maybe aren't really thinking about um, trying to open up areas of flexibility just to be a bit more understanding because there's, there are no rules for a global pandemic and how you're supposed to come from this. So just thinking about um, too, if you're in an environment where tech changes frequently and you needed to furlough someone and you're bringing them back, you know, someone that may have been doing their job for the last six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, you have a fresh set of eyes on a new way of doing things and how the person that was furloughed that does get to come back is going to feel about having had someone do their job for an extended period of time. I'm thinking about technology and even in a fulfillment center environment where if you weren't essential, you're coming back, you know, what sort of retraining do you need in the, in the business um, just based on things that have changed over the last several weeks since you were gone. So that's kind of like the more reboarding element. What a great term. I love that, Talia. Thanks. Yeah. I think there's gonna be so much operational and logistical issues that we're only scratching the surface thinking about right now. Um, that, you know, you raised a bunch of them and, and, uh, and Gina talked about some of them too, but there's gonna be so much to think about before we can really look at how we're going to seriously complete the reentry process. And it's going to look very different than it looked in January. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious when you could start that post-mortem, not that anyone has free time on their hands, but is it time to take notes now while it's kind of fresh? Yeah, and that's why I asked Gina that question. Like, I know we're only six weeks in and we're still in it, but if you look back to week one, would you have done anything differently? I mean, that's a huge lesson, right? And so I think so. I think you start making those notes. Yeah. Um, I also think to Talia's point, I read this, you guys have probably read it. It's a Harvard Business Review article on, on how um, Netflix reinvented HR during the, the time that they had the opportunity to really shift their business model. I read it over the weekend and I probably read it 10 times since then. You know, some jobs it might be obsolete, to Talia's point. Not only have they maybe changed, but they might be obsolete now. If we're home for another six or eight weeks, God help us, maybe some of those jobs aren't going to exist anymore. So then what do you, how do you start to think about those people now? Can you redeploy them somewhere else in the business? Could you retrain them? Um, or m maybe they won't fit. I, you know, I don't know. But I think those are the things we, you, I would, I would be doing every week saying, let's look back. What would I have done differently? And then let's start to look forward. And what do we have to start preparing for? It's just evolving, it, you know, we don't know the end date and that's the hard part, I think, because you, it, it could be, you know, May 30th, it could be October 1st, we don't know. I don't we're... say October 1st. I know, I know, I, 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 I stumbled on that. I... <laughs> to this point, I think we have to be evaluating it constantly. You know, what are, what's changing? What don't we need? What are we realizing we can do with less? What are some operational efficiencies that we might have found by accident that we didn't know we had and just keep a running log of that um, because we're learning as we go and you know to your point Shelley there may be roles there may be people there may be functionalities that we realize we don't absolutely need and uh, are there ways to to reapportion those things. Well, and for me, like I have a client who said that very few jobs could work from home. Well, guess what? They're all working. No one got laid off and they're all at home. So surprise, it's possible. And so now I'm trying to engage those leaders to say, okay, you don't have to go back to the old way because it's working. If people are productive and you can measure productivity and you know, you're taking all that into consideration, continue to be innovative and think about what benefit does that provide maybe for engagement and maybe it's easier to recruit people. I, you know, I don't know that yet. It's still early, but um, I think to think that you could go back to what I'll call the old way of working is um, not accurate or that we won't always go back to the old way of working. To, um, to your guys' point, um, one of the things that we're doing is um, we're taking the opportunity with so many fewer people working to change our payroll system because it impacts a lot less people right this second. And so it's, it, it's a really an actually interesting time to make some of those changes that mm. would be more difficult. Yeah, it's great. Also, it begs the question of uh, the managers that said, Shelly, they can't have remote employees and they wouldn't work. How do you now train those managers and leaders to manage remote employees? Because obviously, when they saw that gap, it wasn't in their bandwidth to, 
is managed that way. Yeah, an example, I talked to them today, the, the supervisor said she wrote someone up because she logged into the phone system at like 8.34. I'm like, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, like, you know, maybe she was feeding her three-year-old breakfast and she just puked or something. I mean, come on, you guys, you know, it's just sort of that stringentness of you yeah. can work from home and just give people a breather, you know, and you keep hearing now measure productivity, not activity or measure results, not activity. And I think that's a mindset for leaders who manage a, a large subset of non-exempt people. Don't manage the activity, manage the results. Cause now you can't see them sitting at their desk doing the work. Now it has to be, what did they spit out on Friday? Um, so you're I always right, you're right. That, yeah, I always tease that slackers are slackers at work they're just doing it at home now. So it's the same population. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, I wanted to respond to, sort of to Talia's point too, that, you know, some jobs, you know, may become obsolete, but also I think that a lot of people are taking this time to be really self-reflective and think about why they do what they do, what they do. Do they like what they do? Do they, are, are they, they reevaluating their priorities? And so I think we have to be prepared too for some, on the flip side, some, some of our employees coming back and saying, I don't want to do this anymore. I'd rather do this, or I don't want to work anymore. I want, my family is way too important. I'm staying home with them. I mean, there's so many uh, things that our employees are actually thinking about too, that I think we have to be prepared for, for those I'm conversations. I'm super hopeful that there were so many startups that were born 2008, 2009, 2010 from people who said, I'm never going to let this happen to me again, or they had spent so much time out of the workforce. They had all these great ideas. They were finally able to execute on them. Family became more important. Health became more important, whatever it might've been. And we got all these really great companies out of it. So I'm hoping that, you know, mm. folks that are able to, in a healthy way, take this time to come up with something great. Um, we're going to see a whole new set of companies, you know, come out of this time. I'm, I'm really hopeful for that. Yeah. And that's actually what I loved about what Gina said. I think Vicki, you bring up a great point, this whole concept of like social employment where people are like, I love who I work with, but I'm actually realizing now that I'm home, I don't actually like what I'm doing and I want to do something different. But then also how do companies think about, you know, keeping that health, that virtual health encouragement going even once we transition back, right? So encouraging them to take a run, encouraging flexible scheduling, you know, maybe they love what they do, but they didn't like working nine to five in the office. It didn't work for their family. So I think we're going to have to throw out the rule book for it all. I think it's an important thing to think about. And I like what someone said earlier about sending out a survey, like, where are you? What have you liked? What haven't you liked? What do you need to be able to come back tomorrow, right? If we were to flip the switch, um, what's your healthcare situation? What's your emotional situation? I think that's important to get that feedback too. Yeah. Kat, your new colleague is so co cozy uh, right there. <laughs> I think I heard a snore too. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what's, what's happening over there? Are you administering Benadryl? Te teach me your ways. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly it. That's exactly <laughs> it. My this is the new COVID playbook. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I got my kids COVID uh, presents. I got them those hoverboards, you know, so I, oh, I saw them. they're zipping behind me like this now. And I'm like, just like, ignore that. They're zipping all over the house. <laughs> you are a brave soul. <laughs> <laughs> well, geez, this open Q&A wasn't such a disaster. Look at us. Yeah, it was, was good. It was good. Gina was great, Keith. Thank you for finding her and suggesting her. I mean, I, I think we all probably want to work at a company like that, right? Which just, it seems so open and vulnerable. And I, and I made a note early on after she said productivity paranoia, reaction uh, will help you survive. And I wrote it down. But like, right, you see the smoke in movie theater, so you should get out of your seat and head to an exit. And so I think that's true in life, like, right? Reaction might lead to survival, uh, right. whether it's changing your business model, maybe changing your health. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I just think that's a really cool way to think about what they're doing. And I love, I'm, I'm going to be anxious to hear what kind of products they're coming up with now that might help change their business and help their business to survive, which yeah. is the point. So. Yeah. She was a gem. When I saw smoke, Shelly, I called you. <laughs> and if I recall, I think I told you like just a little dropper of water will be fine when really yeah. you need like a fire hose. So maybe I wasn't the right person. <laughs> You told me what I wanted to hear at the time. All right, all right. I was trying. <laughs>
I think the when we first, you know, that that first week in, in talking about what we could do, di- what we could do differently, you know, that first week, um, we were like, I I feel like we put too much pressure on our people because we were like, okay, you know, let's just do what we do. Let's sell. What are you doing? How much are you working? And then week two, we were like, oh shit, we gotta. This is this is going to be a little bit different than we. Well, yeah, we thought we could or, outwork it, right? We thought we could just yeah. outwork it. When yeah. in fact, you know, I, I, it was way out of control and way out of our hands for sure. Yeah, the outwork it. That's exactly right. So that's the one thing that I would probably take back if I hadn't. You know, it, it, it was hard to see six. You know, six weeks down down the road. But I would I would have taken more of a deep breath, you know. It it, it took us a couple of weeks to do that and kind of settle into mm-hmm. what we were dealing with. Yeah. So. Well, and for the I, record, I recruited uh, Alan and Martin like today, and they made it. So I, if nothing else. <laughs> oh, there we go. Good to see you guys and I everybody. Had a great time. Oh, I had good. A great time. Yeah. A great session. Thanks for hosting everybody. This is great. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you, you guys again remember if you have any other suggestions of companies or people we might want to speak to please send them our way so we can talk to them and please tell your friends to join if you have other suggestions to make this productive as Keith said at the beginning we really wanted this to be a way for us to learn from best practices and not just talk about legal updates and fmla and how to file the paperwork we wanted it to be really interactive and take away some little nuggets of learning so continue to send those along and we're happy to share the love mm-hmm. It helps Thank me you. to follow Shelly Azen and Cat Bird because every day I'm like, oh shit, I gotta go work out. <laughs> <laughs> They're That's going right. for another run. I gotta, I gotta get my running shoes off. It's getting me through. Uh, all right, excellent. It helps. It helps to hear that in return because there are some days I don't feel like doing it for sure. <laughs> Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Thanks, guys. Taste. Stay well. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.